everyone. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar arranged by the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. I'm your host, Mohammed Sabjan Khan. Tonight's webinar title is Decolonizing the Mind, a conversation with Sandy Hira. The aim of tonight's webinar is to explore the field of decolonial theory and practices. Our speaker tonight is Sandy Hira. Sandhu is Secretary of the Decolonial International Network Foundation. Sandhu has written 25 books on different topics, among them colonialism, etc. His recently published book, An Encyclopedia of Source, with the title Decolonizing the Mind, A Guide to Decolonial Theory and Practice, is also the subject of our discussion tonight. A few words about CAMES. The Center, of, the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, CAMES in short, is a nonpartisan organization based in London, promoting activities to understand Asia and the Middle East better and acts as a hub for engaging with the regions, arts, culture, and politics. We engage through research and dialogue to facilitate a better understanding of these regions from various socioeconomic and political viewpoints. Recently, we have arranged a number of lectures on colonialism, Ottoman Empire, civilizational studies, and other other topics. We have also arranged webinars on the events unfolding in India, Bangladesh, Libya, and Egypt. So for the format of today's program, we'll start with a presentation from Sandhu Hira, which will last about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, it will be followed by comments and Q&A, which will also last around 30 to 45 minutes. So we are hoping to finish the session within one and a half hour. Just to let you know, we observe few rules. We ask our audience to keep their mics mute we encourage questions and discussions, maintaining a respectful professional approach. And we also encourage attendees to take notes on the presentation for the Q&A and comment section. Now, without further delay, let me welcome Sandy Hira to start his talk. Sandy, welcome. Thank you, Saif, and thank you, Games, for this opportunity. I'm, uh, you know, very much looking forward to it. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so if you enable me to um, share it, then I'll, yeah, I'll go, ahead. Uh, go, ahead, you know, go on yeah. here. Okay, good. Um, here we are. <clears throat> so the title of my talk is Towards a New World Civilization. Why, why did I choose this title? And it's also the last chapter of the book, the 13th chapter, uh, is about how to build a new world civilization because I start from the premise that decolonizing the mind is a theoretical framework that explains how to understand the current colonial civilization we are living in and what tools to build to change this world. So I define civilization as a collection of societies with a specific cultural base. That cultural base consists of knowledge production, ethics, uh, views on how to organize and structure a society. Now, I argue that the colonial world civilization, its specific cultural base is the European enlightenment. And the European enlightenment laid out a few on world history, a few on knowledge production, development of economic, social, political, cultural theories, and policies on how to structure a society, including, including a global society. <clears throat> so now, uh, the argument I develop in the book is that colonialism, this world civilization, has instituted something which is called mental slavery. It's a concept that was introduced in the 30s by Marcus Garfi uh, in the United States. Uh, Garfi was a, a, a Jamaican uh, uh, activist uh, who built a one million member movement uh, in North America and beyond. Uh, and he, he came up with this concept of mental slavery. You find it in other parts of the world also, by the way, the idea of mental slavery. Uh, and in order to break from mental slavery, we need to acknowledge the existence of the colonization of the mind. We need to analyze the mechanisms of the colonization of the mind. And knowledge production, production is key in that 
in that process. And we need to the methodology uh, to decolonize the mind. <clears throat> now, how does this methodology look like? Uh, first, it consists of a critique. Uh, if you argue that knowledge is, is colonized, you have to build the argument for it. You can't just put it out as a statement without any empirical uh, validation. So the critique of the Western colonization of the mind and this of Eurocentric knowledge production is a key. If you argue political, economic, social theories are wrong, they are colonized, knowledge has been colonized. You should explain where the colonization of it is and why is it wrong? And, and, and then the other thing is, if you argue that there is mental slavery and you need to decolonize the mind, then the question would be, how do you develop an alternative uh, knowledge production? Uh, and I'll come back to the, the, the methodology of developing this alternative knowledge production, which in my view should be comprehensive, coherent, and integral. And then any knowledge production should be practical. <clears throat> it should be able to translate into practical policies of how to build a society, how to develop a society, uh, and how to build the universal world civilization. So, how do I move forward in the book? First, I offer a philosophical, a, a, a philosophical critique of the Western Enlightenment, the epistemology, uh, which is you know the the, the, the science of, of knowledge. Uh, how are truth and lies produced? Because in the European philosophical tradition, the production of lies is not part of epistemology, because everybody has the intention to produce. Uh, a truth. But I argue that no, there is a specific way in lies in which lies are produced <clears throat> by the Eurocentric epistemology. Then that philosophical critique translated into a historical critique. How did it come about? How was it that uh, 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 the bias uh, the, 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 and, in fact, racism uh, became embedded in knowledge production? I, 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 I develop a theory of how racism was embedded in knowledge production through three phases. Uh, I provide a different worldview, a world history where the Enlightenment has a unilinear view, which says, you know, we move from uncivilized to civilized, from uh, barbarism to modernity, which is a unilinear view. Uh, I argue that, you know, you could view world history through a wider web view, a spider web view, where it develops in different directions, uh, which are not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, from from zero to hundred or from uh, uh, underdeveloped to develop. Uh, there are two schools in the European Enlightenment: liberalism and Marxism, uh, uh, which I which I criticize, uh, uh, and the. The thing about these frameworks is that I argue they are comprehensive, coherent, and integral. Comprehensive means that they cover the major uh, uh, disciplines in, in knowledge production, economic, social, political, cultural theory. Uh, they have a few of world history. Uh, and therefore, they give you a few of how to look at society and how to develop society. <clears throat> Second, that they are coherent. All these different theories are not contradicting each other. They are complementary. They, they, they are a system in which they support each other. And integral means that they have a central base from where they start. And liberalism is individualism. And in <clears throat> Marxism is class and class struggle. So, and in decolonial theory, I argue that uh, that integral element is the concept of decolonizing the mind and mental slavery. Um, so if we develop our decolonial narrative, we thus, don't do it just by imagining something. We look at how other civilizations have been dealing with it, uh, have been dealing with the problems of how to build an economy, how to structure a society, how to develop culture and, and, and knowledge production. Uh, so there have been 
uh, ideas there. So we look into those ideas. Uh, and that's why I try in the book to, to draw from different civilizations. Uh, and obviously it's very limited because there's a fast and huge literature, uh, let alone in English, but in all the other languages, which I don't command. And that's why I think in future, uh, you know, you need a collaboration of all these scientists from different civilizational backgrounds. And then uh, if we look at critical theory today, uh, which is uh, academics and uh, uh, non-academics uh, outside the ac academia, activist spiritual leader who produce thought. And <clears throat> so what I now argue is that uh, we are in this phase of the decline of the West and the rise of the rest, uh, where our discussion is a practical discussion. It's a concerted uh, effort to mobilize intellectual to go to South to develop this alternative to the European Enlightenment. In order to understand, is it is crucial to see how knowledge production has developed in the West. There are five phases in the struggle of Western scientists against Christian theology that led to the removal of ethics from knowledge. Uh, one is that the argument brought forward by Locke that knowledge is derived not from experience, not from religious texts, but from observation and with the senses and reasoning. Then you get Kant who says, look, and I'll give you an example. You know, you could have a bottle with water and you put the water down and you see it goes down. So if you do it 10 times, you could draw the conclusion when a bottle with water is turned uh, down that the water will fall. But then Kant argues, you know, that is fine, observation and reasoning, but that's not enough. You need analysis and theory. So you need to know why does it go down? Uh, and, and, and obviously you have the uh, theory of gravity now that would explain it. And then comes Hegel and says, look, uh, it's, it's not enough, you know, to, uh, uh, to have the theory and, and that explains it, you use the theory also to predict the outcome in the future. So your theory should predict situations in which the bottle, uh, the water might go up instead of down. Uh, and, and if your theory can predict those things, then it is sound. These are the three phases. And then you get the next phase, uh, which is um, uh, basically uh, uh, what the separation from theology and from ethics from science comes from Comte, the French sociologist who says, look, there are these three sub uh, elements in, uh, in knowledge production. Uh, you have the theological state, the metaphysical state and the positive states and theological and metaphysical states are not really knowledge because people uh, are trying to explain phenomena by other uh, uh, means than just by observation and reasoning, uh, and the positivist state is just just that. And then positivism is applied to natural and social world, and here it comes when it's applied being applied to uh, 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 the social world. Uh, it it becomes oh yeah sorry <laughs> uh, yeah. Then we go to the next slide. Uh, the implication of positivism. Yes. Uh, that is this. Science now is based on rationalism because it regards reasons as the source of knowledge. They don't see other sources of knowledge than just observation and reasoning. Uh, uh, but I argue in DTM that we have innate knowledge, we have common sense, we have imagination. There are other sources of knowledge, which is now acknowledged as uh, sources of knowledge in uh, Eurocentrism. Then you get the uh, uh, separation of the subject and object of research. Basically, the researcher uh, is objective. Uh, he might have bias, but if he is aware of it, you know that basically, especially in the social science, you can have objective science. And then the use of mathematics in social science, because as Galileo said, uh, God created the world uh, with mathematics as the language of, of, of uh, the nature of nature, you know, and then in order to gain that authority that natural science has, social science began using mathematics uh, uh, in, in, in uh, economics, uh, uh, social metrics, uh, cleometrics in history, um, uh, claiming that the, the statistics and the economic modeling 
tells you, gives you an accurate picture of, of uh, 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 this natural and social world. And it goes even further. In mathematics, uh, there has been a development in Euro mathematics where in non Euro mathematics, the basis of mathematics was empirical proof. And with Euro mathematics comes the idea of axioms. An axiom is a proposition uh, that uh, doesn't need any proof. And what now becomes uh, uh, apparent in the social sciences that you get an axiomatic approach. Parliamentary democracy is the best system in the world in political theory. You don't have to prove it. You have to accept it. Uh, capitalism uh, is the best economic system. You don't have to prove it. You have to accept it, you see? And that is how axiomatic proof, even if it turns out that parliamentary democracy, if you validate it by empirical research, might not be the best system, you know, or there might be better, but there's no empirical validation. And that is the axiomatic approach from ma uh, mathematics that goes over to social science. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so what happens if you deny the role of ethics in knowledge? You deny the relevance of belief system and you claim a position of neutrality. Uh, you need to claim that your knowledge is universal. So there's, uh, there's no need to think about different perspectives that are valid. It becomes monolithic, monolithic because there's only one possible perspective. And you see that also in the name of the institution of knowledge production in the West. And it has that name is all over the world. That is the university. Uni means one, first thing means truth. So we have an institution that proclaims only one truth. In our new world civilization, that would be an abominable thing. You have universities. You should have pluriversities, you know, institution that, that gives you knowledge from the different civilizations. And obviously, if you have the claim of universalism, you come with a deficient of valid and invalid knowledge, and then in superior and inferior knowledge, and that's how racism then enters knowledge production. Now, next slide. <clears throat> so, um, I divide knowledge in the DTM epistemology as a collection of insights and understanding about the natural and social world as expressed in concepts that describe and explain certain aspects of that world. Now, the way uh, the sources of knowledge in the Eurocentric science, uh, yes, we can make the slides available later. Uh, the sources of knowledge are observation and reasoning, that, that's it. And I argue in the book that there's innate knowledge. For example, the concept of freedom is not something people have learned through the French Revolution, as some authors claim. It's innate. You're, people are born with the sense of freedom. Common sense. Uh, 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 Indian mathematician Raju uh, expresses like this. Uh, I might mistake a snake for a rope, but I won't mistake a rope for an elephant. So there is common sense, uh, which we use in, in, in my discussion of Descartes, uh, how Descartes came to, I think, therefore I am. I use um, uh, 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 common sense to criticize Descartes. Uh, for example, Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. Imagine that you think, you say, I don't think, therefore I am not. That would be a crazy thing to say. You know, what, what does it mean to say I am not? Uh, so common sense tells you that social interaction, where knowledge is only gained by interacting with other people, uh, it's also a critique of Descartes, because Descartes was saying, I'm dreaming, you know, uh, and, and uh, how do I know that I'm not dreaming? Uh, if you are only one person in the world, you can't know, only through social interaction that somebody wakes you up, you know you're dreaming. And so I go into all these other sources of, of knowledge and then I go, go into logic because in the next slide, sorry, next slide. Oh yeah, these were the things I was discussing. Next slide. I, I just have to match <laughs> my story with the slides. Okay, the end result in the development of logic in Eurocentric epistemology is that uh, knowledge comes to the end 
with a prediction of what is true or false. Next slide. But if you take uh, the Indian Jain logic from Jainism, they have seven values of logic. Something may be true, something is false, something may be true and false, something is not assertable, uh, something is uh, true and assertable, false and assertable, false and true and uncertable. So this is a logical system that is much more complex than uh, uh, the Europeans have, and that is even a better way of understanding the world, especially in processes of transformation where things you know, uh, 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 are, are just changing and transforming. And the true and false logic doesn't enable you to understand those transformation processes. Now, my argument is that the basic unit of knowledge is what I call a concept. A concept is an idea that describes and explains certain aspects of the world. And a concept, next, sorry, next slide. Yes, and the next slide. The concepts consist of five elements. One is terminology, for example, the discovery of the Americas. That's a terminology from Eurocentric point of view. The indigenous point of view was the invasion uh, of Latin uh, of Abyayala, because even the name is different. They use the term Abyayala, not not America. Uh, so, terminology is a way to construct knowledge. Uh, language is very important. How you deal with it to construct both truth and lies. You know, you could construct lies also. Then observation, which facts do you bring into your, your proposition? In the case of America, what you, if you leave out the genocide that Columbus uh, and his uh, uh, voyage uh, opened up, uh, then you could build a story about the development of modernity. But if you take on the genocide, you have a development of barbarism. You know, this is, the, the facts are what you take into context are important. Then the analysis, uh, what, how do you frame these facts? How do you develop a storyline to make it understandable what it is about? And then the theory, how is this concept related to other concepts? For example, the concept of the discovery of America is linked to the, the theory of the rise of modernity. Uh, so you explain the rise of modernity consists of, of other things, discovery of America, the rise of science, uh, rationalism, uh, you know, uh, individualism, culture, etc. And then ethics, which is not uh, uh, accepted as part of knowledge production, but in DTM methodology is there. It is uh, that knowledge is not only about true or false, but also about good and bad. Next slide. So you see that how mental slavery now can work. You can construct lies, and it has been done on a massive scale through the academia, uh, and 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 it is uh, then popularized in in media uh, by manipulating the five elements. Uh, and it, regarding ethics in social science, ethics are shoved under the rug, and you claim you claim to be objective. Uh, now, what I do in chapter four, I then go into how the mechanisms of colonizing the mind works. And this is just a sketch. I identify, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, no, no, before it. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, let me see. No, the sources, sorry, first, the sources of, uh, yes. So I look into how the mechanisms of colonizing the mind works. I use three methods. First is, let's study case studies. I take the study by Kenyan author uh, 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 who wrote a book called Decolonizing the Mind, uh, Nugugi, uh, and he discussed how in the educational system uh, uh, the British use the school system and the disciplining the uh, disciplining of, of students to colonize the mind and make them accept British superiority and black inferiority. The second matter is that you look at handbooks. Uh, and I take up the handbook which has been written by scientists on uh, how to manipulate 
the discussions on the occupation of Palestine. What techniques do you use in those discussions to make sure that people uh, uh, adhere to the Zionist position? They have a, a methodology for it. And the CIA has handbooks, which I haven't seen, but uh, uh, a pre uh, former CIA day director, you know, uh, told about these handbooks. And then we just study the media. <laughs> we just study everyday life where you can see how manipulation of the mind is taking place. So next slide. So what I've done, I've listed 34 mechanisms. And I'm, I'm sure there are many more. Once people go into this, they will, they will find a lot more than I came up for now and they could systemize it and, and bring it together in a more maybe a structured way. This is just a list. Uh, you could classify it. Of all the, the, the way uh, the mechanisms, uh, I, I give some examples, the organization of amnesia, uh, which facts do you take into account, which facts don't you, do you, don't you take into account, intimidation, uh, uh, humanizing the criminal, dehumanizing the victims. Uh, let's go to the other one, just to give you a, a broad view uh, and take the other one, you know, and then the other one. Yes, just just that you have an idea of how, what kind of mechanisms we have. Now, let me go to closing uh, because I want to stick to the 30 minutes. Um, I argue that now what does decolonizing the mind means practically is that we built an three trajectories, intellectual, political, and organizational trajectory. Next slide. The intellectual trajectory is to build the alternative knowledge. Natural and social sciences, including life sciences, we should go per discipline, develop new textbooks. The textbooks use the DTM methodology, which is the critique, the alternative, and the translation of theory into practice, the alternative theory into practice. Next, <clears throat> then you have a political trajectory, which is decolonize the university and build the pluriversity, decolonize the media. Many people, their opinions are formed by the eight o'clock news. Uh, uh, and, and how do you decolonize the media? Is something that has to do with power. How do you build a new world order where, which might replace the United Nations because it has become now an instrument of Western manipulation rather than a, a, a platform for dialogue to solve international problems? Uh, are the new institutions like the Shanghai Cooperation or the BRICS uh, uh, or the uh, you know, um, uh, other organizations, uh, non-aligned movement? And how do you translate all this uh, knowledge into the political program for reform or for revolution where reform is not possible? And then you have the organizational trajectory, which I call cater formation. It means that you build educational centers from below like we're doing now. I mean, what Keynes is doing is just that, you know, building educational centers, connecting them so that you, you connect them through the world, build a culture of dialogue and organize a bandung from below where uh, we could bring together uh, intellectuals from the global south and sympathetic intellectuals from the global north to build this alternative knowledge and, and translate it into policy uh, and build this new world civilization. It's a grand idea, but I think that is where we should start rather than with a small idea. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandhu, for this brilliant presentation. Now the floor is open. Uh, for the questions, comments, uh, and further engagement. So we have Abu Alam Ghir. Please unmute your mic and uh, make a comment to ask a question. Welcome. Uh, what do you think of the language, imperial language imperialism of English as a colonizing uh, force? Yes. Uh, well, there are several aspects to it. One is obviously colonization has 
instituted English as a global language. And uh, we are using it. That's why we are conversation in English. Um, there were other times in world history where other language, with like Arabic, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, you see. Uh, uh, but that is one aspect. We, we, we are managing with it. We have uh, been taught in it. But now we have to look at how this language limits our knowledge. I'll give you one example. I have a chapter in the book dealing with gender. And I discussed the work of a Nigerian uh, scholar. Uh, she says that in the language of her uh, uh, people, there is no word for gender. So there is no word for men, women, because society was organized not based on gender, but based on age. So what does it mean that your language does not have uh, the categories and, and has other categories in understanding and structuring society than English, where you have only this language and this categories. So you structure reality according that the language offers you. So I think this discussion of language goes beyond the, the imposition of imperial power to speak the specific language in which they colonized us. It goes beyond that. Thank you, Sandhu. Uh, Paul, Paul Webster is next. Please, Paul, unmute <laughs> your mic and... Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, oh, we hi can. There. Well, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Sandhu. Wonderful. Uh, uh, Two further questions emerge from your presentation, which I've been intrigued to see your um, comments upon. Um, you, you quite rightly point out that Eurocentric knowledge formation is based upon theories to, to predict outcomes. So this kind of predictive element to outcomes, as in Hegel, as in, in Marx, for example. Um, I would add also that the purpose of Eurocentric knowledge is not just to predict outcomes, but also to manipulate outcomes. So one is about prediction, which is like passive observation. Yeah. The other is manipulation, which is about, about to yeah. control yeah. the world. So, for example, two examples spring to mind. Uh, the, the Bengal famine of 1943 was based upon... Uh, an economic knowledge base designed to produce a certain result. So it's about it's a, about producing an outcome to the benef benefits um, of, in this case, the, um, oh. the the imperial power. So I think an important aspect of knowledge production in Europe and the West is not just to predict outcomes, but to also control outcomes for their benefit. So I wonder if you've got any views on that. And secondly, um, the division between uh, ethics and facts. Um, I would suggest that uh, in the West, it was it was a submergence of ethics um, to, to disappear, but there was an ethics at, at work. It, 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 it was the ethics of greed and self-satisfaction, the ethics of what's called possessive individualism, the ethics of um, self-concern and not other regarding. So if, if you look at um, economic theory, for example, which atomizes the individual as a self-serving, self-seeking individual, um, so I would say it's not so much the disappearance of ethics, but the supplanting of a certain ethical posture, mm. which is around the promotion of self-individualism. Whereas, of course, in most of the world, ethics is about a self-regarding outlook, caring for others in some sort of community. So um, could you perhaps make a few comments on those couple of points, please? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, first of all, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the the 
purpose of knowledge production, Eurocentric knowledge production, uh, became uh, uh, a matter of manipulation of the mind. You know, I, I categorize it in terms of the mental slavery because it was manipulation of the mind uh, to colonize the mind, to control the mind in order to accept the world as it is. Uh, and um, that, that aspect is very strong, especially in the liberal tradition of, of Eurocentric knowledge, uh, where liberalism became the ideology of colonialism, uh, of colonial uh, rule. Uh, and uh, 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 leaving ethics uh, out of it, create, uh, uh, creating the idea of universalism, of objective knowledge, that was all within this tradition of, of um, uh, the, the liberal school, uh, as you might call it. And the way they use, I, I give an economic theory, the example of how a maximum profit uh, became a neutral a label for an ethical value, which is called greed, as you mentioned, you know, that is how they remove ethics. Uh, it's not removed, they shove it under the rug uh, and, and use these neutral terms. That's a, uh, that is, uh, yes, how ethics and facts are manipulated. But then there's another thing I think, which is very important is that science in the Western tradition became atheist. That's important because that spills over into the Marxist tradition uh, where uh, uh, ethics uh, and, and, and you know this idea of uh, objective science and scientific socialism, we'll, one of the discussion we'll have in the future, Paul, I'm very looking forward to it, um, where atheism became a cornerstone of science. While in other traditions, uh, because ethics was explicit in the, the way you organize a society is based on values, is based on, on uh, core values. And these values are derived from uh, a few a cosmology, a few of how you look at the world uh, and, and how you fuel the sense of human existence. That is the source of ethics. And in someone is religion, in Confucianism, you know, it's a philosophy about uh, how people uh, relate to each other and to the state. In African philosophy, Ubuntu is how people relate specifically to uh, each other as human being. In indigenous philosophy, in Latin Abiala, Latin America, uh, it's about the relation between nature and society. So these are views of cosmology that derives gives you ethical value that then you could input into knowledge production. While in Eurocentrism, in, in the both schools, uh, it became atheist because uh, knowledge was there only about true and false and not particularly anymore about right and wrong. Brilliant, thank you, Sandhu. Uh, next is Naim. Naim, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhu. Um, well, the, the the very colonization process, we know it is the outcome of uh, Eurocentrism and also modernity. And the very world that we're living in at the moment, uh, Sandhu, that uh, the whole educational framework, even all the socio socioeconomic, sociopolitical models that we're living in are made uh, out of the, the Western models, the Eurocentrism, uh, which Paul and you have been talking about. So when you talk about decolonization, what do you really actually mean? Do you mean that uh, you, you know, an, an, an alternative model going beyond this uh, modern, modernist frame, framework? How is that even possible? And why would you start, start from? Well, let's look at the history of knowledge production. Liberalism took 300, 350 years to develop. Marxism took 200, 250 years to develop. Uh, decolonial theory is only a few decades old. So we are at the beginning of a process. Uh, but if you look across the world, it's a major topic in many 
intellectual circles, decolonial theory. Uh, uh, my my uh, critique of the phase we were in decolonial theory is that it was not comprehensive, integral, and coherent. So we we would have a lot of contribution on, for example, epistemology. You know, decolonizing epistemology, decolonizing political structures, decolonizing social relations. Uh, we didn't have really a decolonial economic theory. We didn't really have a decolonial cultural theory. Um, and I think that trying to figure out how these frameworks can develop is, is a challenge. In the book, I gave the example of Islam, Islamic theology, as an example of a comprehensive, coherent, uh, and integral framework, uh, where knowledge production has been organized in such a way that you take the central concept of Tawid, the oneness of Allah, uh, uh, going into what this means uh, in terms of how to structure a society, economic, and political, uh, socially, cultural, with the concept of the Uma, uh, how then economic, Islamic economic theory is based uh, on the concept of social justice, uh, and not particularly independent on whether it is private ownership of means of production. Um, so th there are other frameworks possible. Uh, we, we need to study them and we need to see how it develops and how it can be incorporated in this uh, global uh, 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 diverse uh, frameworks that are developing now. Uh, so I think, first of all, uh, the concept of a comprehensive, coherent and integral framework is important to understand, to develop and have people with different contributions from different uh, uh, traditions uh, 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 help develop this framework. S second thing is this. We are now in a world, we are living in a world in which is, it is becoming a necessity. It's not a luxury anymore. The, if you follow what's happening after, since the war in Ukraine, the whole talk about a multipolar world is a talk about how the new world takes shape in political centers, in a variety of political centers. It is not yet there to discuss it in terms of a variety of cultural centers, of cultural tradition. It is there, but it's not fully developed as the concept of a multipolar political world. So this idea of a new world civilization is something, you know, the work that now uh, James is doing and other uh, people and other centers in the world uh, that is where we should go for. So I think it's realizable, it's uh, uh, necessary. Uh, and, and you know, we are at the beginning of the whole process of all these contributions. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Sandhu. Uh, the next uh, person raised their hand is Aisha. Aisha, please unmute yourself and ask the question. So firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Sandy for um, you know, identifying this huge gap in academia, that of the transformative aspect of learning. It's very, very important that somebody is addressing this uh, issue finally. So um, looking at your presentation, a few thoughts uh, coming into my mind, and these are just like I'm thinking out loud, and these could be potential questions or potential areas that you could uh, look into or you might already have looked into in your book. So uh, you're talking about decolonizing the mind. And I was just wondering uh, why not the mindset? So, uh, or if that is included in it. And then you're talking about um, how the uh, colonized, they have been uh, you know, developed, uh, an inferiority complex has been developed into them. But what about this white man's burden and the superiority complex that has been developed into the white man? So um, maybe the white man is as colonized uh, in, in terms of uh, the mind or the mindset um, as the colonized uh, people are. So maybe this is also one aspect that could be looked into. And you're talking about the role of education system, which is very important. Then it's not just uh, the knowledge that is produced, but also the pedagogy that has been introduced. So the, you're talking about the structured uh, learning but then road learning is also a very important part of it. So how is any critical thinking going to be developed 
in a system of rote learning, which is still being followed in the, um, you know, the colonies, uh, the uh, previous colonies, let's say. So uh, we were talking about sources of knowledge and uh, Muhammad Iqbal has explored multiple sources of knowledge. And he's also talking about the active intellect and intuition and levels of, you know, these sources of knowledge. And you may also want to look into Ibn Haldun's theory of rise and fall of civilization. So when we talk about the colonizers, um, you know, uh, occupying or subjugating a people, uh, why does the onus um, always lie on the colonizers? What about the people who allow themselves to be subjugated? So sometimes it feels uh, to me that uh, this decolonization is sort of a victim's mentality too, that uh, putting the blame always on the colonizers and not on the colonized. Like Iqbal said, Europe so maybe this is also one aspect. And um, in the end, I would just like to say, oh, you're talking about ethics. Who gets to decide what is right and what is wrong? That is a major debate or major problem in the world of today. And also, what about the future of knowledge production? So maybe while we would be looking at the uh, past sources of knowledge production and you know identifying them, mm -hmm. developing something with the guards that, in the future, uh, think about the chat, um, GPT chatbots or AI or VR, and we would be still a colonized people because we would not have uh, like all these te uh, technologies would be already colonized if uh, I had been able to convey my point. So just as we are using this language of colonizers because we have uh, like it has become a lingua franca or it has become a necessity, we would be using various sources of knowledge in the future as well. So these are some things that I wanted to. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a, a fast array of questions and topics, and I think very important topics also. Uh, so let, let me start with, with the first one, uh, decolonizing the mind or the mindset. I, I, I see them more or less, you know, as the same, the, the mind and the mindset. Uh, so yeah, I would argue it would be included. And then the white man burden, I argue that decolonizing the mind is not only about decolonizing the mind of the colonizer. It's also decolonizing the mind of the, uh, uh, of the colonized. And I explain in the mechanisms of how uh, 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 the mind is colonized, how the mind of the white, uh, uh, in, in fact, I use this, uh, uh, the white man burden's poem to give as an example, you know. Um, and then the question of pedagogy, that is very important because uh, uh, it is linked to many things. It's not just uh, the way we have been uh, uh, taught to teach, taught to learn, taught to get knowledge and uh, transmit knowledge, but obviously it's also uh, the mechanism of including knowledge uh, of people who are, uh, I, I, I learned a lot about Ubuntu philosophy where the, in, in some cases, you have obviously expert knowledge where, you know, the teacher transfers expert knowledge. But there's also knowledge which is not expert, but is based on interaction of people. And a student and a, and a teacher could there be on the same plane. Because if you take the experience of, of students and incorporate it in the learning process, it's a different pedagogy than, uh, you know, the expert knowledge. And and then uh, I I gave uh, I gave the example of uh, friends of mine in Mexico who are building a new university call it intercultural university they start with agriculture uh, because it's a farming community it's a project by the Ministry of Education where they try to bring in the knowledge of the wise elderly people of a uh, community and then combine it with expert knowledge of academics. You know, these are very different pedagogies which are involved in those you know, structures. So I think, yes, when we talk about decolonizing education, it's not only about the knowledge, it's also about the institution and the structures of pedagogy, et cetera. And then uh, the DTM is for me not something blaming people for things. It's creating a different uh, uh, knowledge structure. Acknowledging that there is what Mark Colomix calls uh, calls this element of the house Negro, you know, which 
in, in our community uh, play a specific role in colonizing the mind and colonizing. Um, and um, yeah, uh, and then the question of ethics, uh, that's the thing. Uh, in nobody, the, how do you decide right and wrong? There's no formula for it and there's no one person deciding on it. In many communities, it has been evolved where well, experience of a community taught you what is right or wrong and how to move it. It's not a, a thing which you decide for now till eternity, you know, and it is uh, uh, in the process of how to build a society, uh, uh, you know, by, by trial and error, uh, rather by uh, specific mechanics. And then um, the role of technology in knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. Already in knowledge dissemination, it takes a huge role. But taking AI, which goes further than the, the distribution of knowledge, but the production of knowledge in itself through technology, you know, uh, that, that will be a major thing in the future. Uh, and, and we have to pay attention to that when we talk about how to build new centers of knowledge and how AI uh, will, uh, will play a role in it. So knowledge production in the future, in my view, is linked to how you build a future world civilization. It's not just about the knowledge, it's about what kind of society are we building in, given the fact that we are in a global world where we have different tradition, which is not universal anymore. Absolutely, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Sandhu. Next is Mac. Uh, Mac, uh, please unmute your mic and okay. ask your question. Uh, my question is uh, maybe a different angle to the question uh, that was just asked. Uh, I would like to ask your opinion about, do you think uh, ontology, do we need some ontology of liberation in a sense? Do we need some understanding of who a human being is for a successful intervention? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking as a Muslim who thinks that mind is just another Eurocentric uh, ideological construct. You talk about the colonizing mind. Uh, uh, do you is it is it the colonizing mind, mind just a metaf metaphor uh, for you, or uh, or do you do you take the Eurocentric uh, ontology, or do you think in general that we need some understanding of human nature for successful decolonization? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I touch upon it briefly in the book, in the discussion between the relationship between body and mind. Uh, where in Eurocentric philosophy, basically, there's a notion that um, the relationship between body and mind is that once the mind, once the body is gone, the mind is gone. Right. So that is a a vision of how you look at uh, uh, human beings and the nature of human beings. So uh, as soon as a person dies, the, the mind doesn't exist. And so the, the unity of body and mind, it's gone. Uh, and in fact, there was no mind outside the body. Now in other philosophies, and I take again the concept of uh, Ubuntu in African philosophy, and I guess, uh, you know, uh, Islam and other philosophical traditions have might uh, other ideas. There is where a human being is seen as part of a community. It's not an individual. It's a person of so even if the body is dead, the legacy of that person is still alive. In the way its contribution to the community, uh, uh, in the way it has um, institutionalized contributions of the individual individual to society on on a basic level obviously it's in in family where uh, you know uh, uh, people uh, cherish uh, not only the memory of uh, their ancestors but also uh, the lessons they learned from their ancestors and therefore the ancestors are still alive in those lessons it's an other concept of how you look at at, at mind and body um, and uh, so the, the way you deal with uh, ancestry uh, uh, in, in, in family is, 
is uh, around the concept that the, the body is gone, but the person is still uh, alive in, in different forms. Um, so, yes, I think that uh, when we're talking about decolonizing the mind, the philosophical discussion about uh, a relation of body and mind and of being in general, eh, what, what, what does it mean uh, uh, to, to, to say you, you are there, you are there as a human being, as an, in the Eurocentric is as an individual, but in other philosophy is as an part of, of social relation. And then in the indigenous philosophy in Bolivia, for example, where they have the concept of Pachamama, the human being is also part of nature. So uh, your relation to nature and relation to community comes also into play. Uh, so, so yeah, that would be my answer to your uh, remark. Thank you, Sandhu. I'm going to read a question from Moti Rahman, question slash comment. Uh, and his comment is, or question is, the chronology seems to be relativism, rationalism, axiomism. Are you proposing a phenomenological system? It has an impact on epistemology. Okay, you have to break this down for me because there are a lot of terms that are, which are uh, complex and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so what is so, it when you mean relativism? Let me ask yeah. Mati, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, he, yeah. Is, he is there. So Mati, yeah. please unmute yourself yeah. and ask the question directly. Thank you. Yeah. And, Thank and explain the question to yeah. me because yes. I, I might not understand it. it. Right. Yeah. Um, actually, it's a lovely presentation. I've learned a lot from your presentation. I haven't come across you before uh, yet, so unfortunate for me. So I've learned a lot. But Thank coming you. to think about uh, what you say, so we had, you know, before positivism, we had sort of philosophical rationalism and relativism before. So we had the two battles there. Uh, relativism versus rationalism. Then we've moved over, according to what you say, to a new sort of axiomism, where there's no justification for the current philosophy. It's just that democracy is right, and West is better, and the education system is better. Now, if we go into that, what we are talking about, you know the terms you, when you talk about knowledge, it seems to me rather to be values because knowledge is something which is like mathematical knowledge, regardless of time. Uh, it's evident and it doesn't change at all, while the sort of values change. Now, if we then have, I'm thinking about phenom phenomenological, you know, that's mixed with the mind. So, you know, your values, your personal experiences, insights, that's very subjective, which, so we might have, thousands of different sort of personal knowledges, um, uh, individual experiences, which we call knowledge. But then again, it has a huge sort of uh, epistemological issue there when everyone sort of defines knowledge according to their own subjective personal views. You can have plural cultures and say, one question to 50 answers to one question subject to, uh, subject to the person's background, beliefs, experiences, perceptions. Um, so that has a huge impact. What would you say to this? This is fascinating. I, I'm, okay. I'm not actually uh, dishing you. I'm learning, but it's critically thinking about it. You know, yeah. when you go to <laughs> sort of rationalism, it's fine because it's self-evident. When we go to relativism, or sort of phenomenological understanding of sort of pluralism has an yes. impact on epistemology. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I understand your, your question yeah. and your remarks. Uh, first of all, um, uh, the idea uh, that, let's say, uh, for uh, phenomenological uh, uh, theory, uh, as I understand it, is that they, they see that the source uh, of, of knowledge and values is the experience of human being, right? So, but in my understanding, experience is only one source of knowledge. Innate knowledge, social interaction, imaginations are other sources of knowledge. Right, so 
that is the first remark that yes, absolutely experience is a source of knowledge, but not the only source. And now we have to say what sources of knowledge are applicable in what situations. And then the second thing comes about uh, the universalism that was that arose in Western knowledge production was based on rationalism, which means that the reason is our instrument to understand reality and to change reality, to manipulate reality. That is the, uh, the reason. And reason is objective. And then comes relativism. I said, hey, oh, oh, it's not objective, it's relative. Yeah? Because uh, what you call objective in other cultures, they have other values. Uh, so uh, that is relativism. And, and then the question becomes, but if, is there multiple truth or is there only one truth, right? And here is the thing. In the Western philosophical tradition, they struggle with this because they don't use common sense as a source of knowledge. But in other, other uh, things, it, it was there, which is empirical validation. If you want to know, you have to build a bridge across a river. One guy says, or one woman says, you know, you need uh, 10 uh, tons of, 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 of bricks, you know? And the other, that, no, we need five tons. What, we, what is relativism? It's not everyone has his own truth. Empirical validation tells you, no, if you measure this, you know, that is the, the, the number you need. If it's on that level, empirical validation, in, in question of knowledge where, values are, are less important uh, uh, and, and ethics are less important, yeah? then you have empirical validation. So relativism doesn't work there also. You can't yeah. say everybody has his own truth because if you build a bridge, ultimately one person, you know, one tier will tell you if the bridge will, will match or not. And that's his empiricity. It's not a person. Yes. You know. Yes. So, you know, my, my argument is Western philosophical tradition has set a very low bar, has dropped the bar of knowledge. And they use authority, oh, Kant, Hegel, Hume, Locke, you know, great names. But if you look what these guys were saying, compared to what other, from other civilizations have been saying, they were talking sometimes totally nonsense, you see? Uh, while other people have already thought about it, I'll give the example of logic, for example, uh, where I discuss how Chinese philosophers look at Aristotle, his uh, 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 logical system, and how the Chinese which was much more advanced in discussing uh, logic than, than Aristotle was. So that's why I think it's crazy that in this time, we don't teach other philosophies. When we discuss philosophy, we only teach you know, European philosophy and think that Aristotle and all these other were the great thinkers. Uh, but we, because we don't have a critical look at those thinkers. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sandy. Next is Rubaiyat. Rubaiyat, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks. Well, thank you, Sandy. That was an amazing pre uh, presentation. I, I was just, uh, before going, I was looking at the table of contents of your book and I, just was blown away with the scope uh, of what you've covered. Uh, a lot of things come to my mind, but uh, maybe maybe I'll start with a few uh, connecting points. A few, uh, I mean, a month ago or something, I, I encountered this book uh, uh, called The Dawn of Every Everything uh, by uh, David Graeber and David Wengo. And in that book, they discussed a kind of, um, a different kind of view of ancient history. Uh, Graeber was a, uh, art, uh, he, he was an anthropologist who passed away, and Wengro is, a, is, a, is an ancient historian. So, uh, you know, politically they're from uh, what is called the, uh, uh, I guess they're, they're uh, uh, anarchist in their political view. So, mm -hmm. but, but I mean, in, in, in their uh, like uh, exploration of uh, arch, uh, ancient archeology, span they challenged the Hobbesian and uh, you know 
they, they challenge the both, uh, both Locke and Hobbes in the way they set up the idea of what human beings were. And I, I thought that this is very interesting because this is, this is uh, coming from a Western tradition, uh, this work, but it's challenging the kind of like uh, pre-existing or, or currently existing Western ideas of how we view our origins and our, how we view like our uh, thing. So, I mean, in, in, your, uh, in your work, you, you, you're, you're looking at decolonizing uh, the mind and setting up a new system. So what kind of, um, what's, what's your take on these kind of Western approaches to sort of revising their previous views uh, and, and trying to become at least positioning themselves to be more enlightened than uh, the more parochial or sort of more uh, colonial kind of uh, attitude. This is my yeah. first sort of common okay, question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, there, there is a school, you know, that arose uh, in the 20th centuries uh, called postmodernism. Right. And the, the idea of postmodernism was this. The modernity as a narrative of universal and rational progress of mankind, looking at how the world is today, you know, they argued, it doesn't match. Right. So modernity, the world is irrational. It's not universal. There are different you know, traditions. So that's why they say we need to get out of the grand narratives, which liberalism and Marxism presented, and we go beyond mod modern modernity. That's what postmodernism is. And you will have more of this kind of narrative. For example, uh, you know, you have this uh, uh, big history uh, uh, trend where you know, history is described from the Big Bang till today uh, and brought in. So my, my point in this is, how do they relate this to colonialism as a world civilization? If they don't do that, they miss a big point. So the particular persons you mentioned, I didn't read them. I didn't know right. about them. So, so, you know, I could look into them if I get the reference. But in general, I would ask the poll that this world civilization didn't come out of nothing or develop just as a world thing. No, there is a specific break in world history, a turn, not a break, a turn in world history, where since the past 500 years, we, a global world has been created. And the creation of the global world in terms of the economic, political, cultural uh, 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 systems, social systems, that is what you have to take into account if you want to build any theory. You see, right. if you leave that out, then I think you will miss a lot of how to understand the world. Uh, and, 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 and so I argue how the, the, on the biggest things, economic, social, political, cultural theory, world history, natural sciences, uh, you could see how the colonial world civilization has impacted these disciplines. So it's, it's not just a general idea or general, it is a practical thing of to look at these uh, institutions. So that is how I would judge those uh, theories, you see? Right. Uh just a, a segue into this, like uh, towards a practical sort of a question about the practical approach and specifically you talked about, uh, you know, Chinese uh, logicians and logic and mathematics is something that I'm very passionate about. That's from, that's where the question comes from. Uh, so if, if you have, uh, if you, if you have a set of people who want to explore the other logical systems other than the Western I mean, the Western uh, canon right now is formidable itself. But if you want to explore all of that together, what kind of practical uh, uh, system can we create where this is both economically uh, viable and it, it's also like, a, you know, it could be a lifelong effort into uh, a particular, you know, uh, knowledge 
uh, so you want to you want to gain knowledge, but you want to do, do it outside of this uh, Western structure of uh, you know university and this kind of thing. How, how do you propose? Maybe you can uh, enlighten us on. This right. The, the first thing I wouldn't say that there's only one way. Right. So we 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 search for that one particular way. Uh, that would go against everything we are doing about pluriversity, you know, that there are different ways of the, that's one. Second is, I don't discuss the university as they own everything is nonsense there. Because there are people working in those institutions who are working with us, you know, who are, who are there, who are make valuable contributions. So I, obviously these people have a difficult time in their own institutions where if they come up with it, they will, you know, so surely get opposition. And but that's the fight they have to to to, to uh, do there. Uh, and then uh, uh, knowledge is not only produced in academia; it's also outside of academia. So uh, uh, we we develop that with with people who are like me. I'm not working in, the, in academia, but I publish books and I write books and and so on. So. Uh, uh, connecting all these dots help you build this worldwide infrastructure like games is doing now with you know all this the work there so i think one of the things is how do we connect what is already there to build this global thing you see and i think that is it needed in my view a theoretical framework that says hey we could look at it from a comprehensive view, from a coherent view, and from an integral view, and then people can build, help build that that framework, uh, and then it translates into uh, from courses to webinars to institutions to uh, for now, for example, we have a formal relation with the University of Free State in South Africa, uh, where we discuss. Now, how do we bring this within the university? How do you get it in terms of a module, whatever? But, you know, university politics is also very complex for persons outside. You know, there's a lot of things going on there which has nothing to do with science and knowledge. Uh, and, and people have to figure out how to move with those things. But I think we are now in a phase where uh, that is possible and that should be encouraged and people should develop ideas of how to connect this. Thank Brilliant. you very much. Thank you, Sandhu. So I have a couple of questions. One comment, one question uh, to you. Uh, let's say that I'm coming from a Marxist perspective and I'm taking Marxism as specifically for a reason. Let's say that I'm coming from a Marxist perspective. Why would I be interested in DTM? any kind of decolonial theory, because Marxism presents a comprehensive, a kind of a, a coherent framework through which I can analyze any particular world event, past, present, future. I can see at ecology and ecological destruction, which is being caused by capitalist ventures. And I can analyze it through Marxist perspective. I can see gender. I can analyze it through Marxist perspective. I can see uh, economics, obviously, politics, imperialism, and so on and so forth. So there is, there seems to be, uh, uh, what what, uh, what I'm trying to ask is, specifically from Marxist perspective, what, uh, what uh, DTM has got to offer, the first thing. And the th second thing is a uh, much more generic thing, and but very interesting for me, and I'm sure for many people who are interested in mathematics and sciences, hard sciences, so to say, Let's say that I'm a mathematician who has been trained in mathematics for the last 30, 40, 50 years and so on. I can understand that, yes, knowledge production, European metropolis sort of centric, Eurocentric knowledge production, especially in humanities, social sciences has been very biased and so on. So I agree with that. And I encourage DTM and other sort of uh, frameworks, civilizational frameworks to analyze this, decolonize it and so on and so forth, produce their own knowledge systems. But when it comes to mathematics, uh, an obvious question, and this has, uh, whenever I have discussed decoloniality, decolonial mathematical ventures, as you, I'm sure, have done, people come up with this particular question that now if we are talking about decolonial mathematics, are we going to stop saying one plus one is two? Is it going to be something else? 
right? And it's a very obvious question. So how can we, I'm, again, I'm not talking about history of mathematics or history of philosophy or history of sciences. I'm talking about the practicalities, the practice of mathematics now and for the future. So how can we, do you, first of all, do you see what are the elements of coloniality, Eurocentricism, which are present within the, uh, within the venture of practice of mathematics and hard sciences. Hard, forget about hard sciences for a moment, but mathematics. And the second connected question would be, how can we move forward if there are such elements present in mathematics? How can we move forward to decolonize it? The practice very, of mathematics. Yeah, very important and interesting questions. Well, regarding the first questions, I come from a Marxist background. I was a Marxist. I was a Trotskyist, which is even at the extreme left of Marxism, right? So I come from Marxism to decolonial theory. And why? Why did I come from Marxism to decolonial theory? Why, in my uh, younger years, you know, I saw the, the, the comprehensive nature of Marxism, class struggle, uh, 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 class as a, as a so social unit of analysis, historical materialism that explains, you know, how society develops, the mode of production, all these instruments were there. For me, and many Marxists like me, especially from the global north, reality knocks on the door. And one reality is, our greatest example was the Russian Revolution. And the Russian Revolution created the Soviet Union, which should have been the model of how to develop this new world. And in 1989, 1990, the Soviet Union, you know, was dissolved and, and, and dissolved and didn't exist anymore. Um, uh, in China, uh, it seems as if capitalists are as important as the state in transforming the whole economic system there. So uh, Marxism as a, as a narrative of liberation, reality knocks on our door and says, hey, this historical materialism, this all this basic concept of Marxism enables us to understand society as we are living in, or uh, how does that relate? And then coming from the global south, obviously, the experience of colonialism. We link it with the experience of colonialism. So then going through the Marxist theories in the different disciplines, economic theory, social theory, uh, cultural theory, political theory, you know, going through a world history, through all their things, that is where, because of the demise of the Soviet bloc and internationally of the idea of Marxism as a philosophy of liberation, because of those practical things that happened in the world, it brought me to take a closer look at my own heritage. Obviously, I came from the Marxist movement and I still, you know, when I hear the international as a song, it moves me, you know? And there's a lot of things in the culture of struggle of Marxism, which I still cherish deep in my heart, you know, uh, 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 the anti-imperialism, the inter-international solidarity were great things of Marxism, you know, um, but uh, there, there's a, a Ubuntu uh, philosophy uh, that, that says in, in being honest, I respect you. By being honest in our critique of Marxism, we respect Marxism. You know, by saying, okay, this is where we come from. The second thing is about hard sciences and mathematics. Now, I've been working closely with Raju, you know, Indian mathematician Raju, uh, when developing this, this chapter on uh, chapter seven of mathematics. And my argument is that decolonizing mathematics is about five things. One is the uh, historiography, but that is a small thing for me. We could deal easily with it by having new textbooks that take into account all the contributions from different things. The second is the axiomatic approach of mathematics. So where does the axiomatic approach 
lead to a different mathematics than the empirical approach. Because the axiomatic approach puts out some axioms, which are propositions without proof. And from those axioms, you draw up a mathematical system. And I explained in this book, if you do that, you get crazy mathematics. For example, the Ramanujan series. One plus two plus three plus four leads up to minus one divided by 12. Now, common sense, common sense is a good source of knowledge. So we apply common sense to Ramanujan theory and say $1 plus $2 plus $3, you, you get $1, $2, $3, and you end up in death. Common sense tells you this, it's not possible, but mathematics tells you this. And then we go and look, but what was wrong in Euro mathematics? And that is the concept of infinity. Infinity is seen just like a number. One is a representation of a quantity, but infinity is not a representation of quantity. So by putting that as an argument, we could say decolonizing the mind is criticizing the axiomatic approach of mathematics. And they don't do that in Euro mathematics because you know, they just think that that's the only form of mathematics that is possible. And then you get the crazy things like uh, uh, Whitehead and Russell writing this book proving one and one is two. You know? And now I, I gave the example of a British comedian who says, suppose they came to another conclusion because beforehand it was not certain. Suppose they came to the conclusion one and one is three. What does it mean? All the bridges have been built, all the doctors have developed apparatus, everything worked with this proposition. So it tells you that the axiomatic approach is just nonsense. You see, so the critique of the, the, the decolonial critique is a critique of the foundations of Euro mathematics as an axiomatic approach versus the empirical approach. How do you get a mathematics which is based on empirical proof? Uh, you know, these are different types of, of mathematics. And then the third thing is that. Um, the use of mathematics in, in social sciences, you know, because the idea is that mathematical rules applies to social, can be applied to social relations, especially in economics, where econometrics is a very well-founded branch of economics, economics, you see, and uh, many models out there. Uh, so you could criticize them because they assume that the system is stable. That's why it works. But as soon as the system is in transition, all these models are lost. So you could have a critique of how this is used. Eh? And Asad Saman, you know, put out a series of lectures on how to look at statistics, you know, and, and shows how statistics can be used as a manipulation of uh, 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 reality, you see? So that's the third thing of uh, the critique of mathematics. And the, the, the next one is education. We have learned mathematics through Euro mathematics, but other civilizations have other pedagogy. I give the example of Chinese and Japanese mathematics where uh, 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 they use lines and, and, and crosses of lines where, where uh, 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 you, you use uh, different lines in different directions to calculate, uh, let's say, uh, an equation or uh, uh, 340 uh, multiplied by 500,000 or so. Yeah. They use these lines. And that could be for people who are visually inclined, it could be a very good way to teach mathematics beyond the Euro mathematics. And the last thing is what I call reverse engineering. And this is the most creative part of mathematics. Because you have been taught that the axiomatic approach and what we now see is the only possible mathematics, your mind doesn't venture into how would I build a pyramid if I didn't have the instrument of Euro mathematics with all its equations and all its uh, languages. 
because people have done it. They have done it. Hyderabad in India has a algorithm for the square root of two without this, without the calculator, you know? So um, I think that is the five elements of, uh, of decolonial mathematics. And then regarding the hard science, I would suggest that looking critical at the hard science, you, you, you get things like, for example, in biology, life science, you have the classification of Linnaeus on how to view animals and, and, and human nature. But those classification is based on Eurocentric values of how you look at animals. If you have a different view, you know, you call, in, in Hinduism, the cow is a sacred animal. Where do you put that in Linnaeus, uh, the sacredness in, in Linnaeus classification, you see? But take astronomy, <laughs> the Big Bang theory, right? Um, uh, astronomer thinks that their theories is based on observation of the expansion of the universe. And the Big Bang theory is based that, oh, if there's an expansion, then logically there was a contraction, you know, up to a point where the Big Bang took place 30 mil 40 million years ago from a point. And then they say, then the laws of nature doesn't work anymore. That is what, you know, uh, Stephen Hawkins is saying in his book. Uh, and and not, all, all the astronom astronomers are saying, before the Big Bang, we don't know what it was. They acknowledge themselves that there's the end of knowledge for them. What was there before the Big Bang? It's not, who, who is going to answer that question if you can't empirically define what is before Big Bang, you see? And then you come into the realm of cosmology. How do you view the world, et cetera? So I think we have legitimate issues in decolonizing my, uh, mathematics and the hard sciences. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sandhu. Uh, I'm not completely <laughs> convinced, but uh, I need to work on decolonizing my mind. <laughs> No, it's, it's a matter of dialogue. Question. It's a matter of dialogue. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And this <clears> is very <throat> fruitful field. So, yeah, this is great. Uh, and the last question for tonight's session is from Bushra Punjabi, and I'm reading the question. Uh, where do people, societies facing the acts of settler colonialism fall in this discourse of decolonizing minds and knowledge fall? For example, in Indian-occupied Kashmir, one can get penalized in the worst case, in the worst case possible for just uh, for just uh, calling out Indian rule as settler colonialism. Colonialism. Mm -hmm. So my question is basically, how can decolonizing minds or theories be practiced in a violent political setting like Kashmir, where even knowledge production is in the hands of Indian state colonizers? Right. <clears throat> well, uh, this is has been the history of colonialism altogether. It's, you know what happens in Kashmir is happening now, also in Palestine. You know, happened during apartheid uh, uh, in South Africa, happened during colonialism with the genocides and so. So <laughs> the question now becomes how to build a new world civilizations where you find a solution for problems like Palestine and Kashmir and all, all these things. Can GTM provide an answer to what kind of road should we go into? And my answer is yes, it can. Why? Because look into the basic question. Do every party involved in this conflict, not only in Kashmir, all the, what is the end game? Where do you want to go? Let's say, take the case of Palestine. <clears throat> you know, For the Zionists, it's clear. The end game is eternal rule of occupation. I think the same will go for India, you know, eternal rule of Kashmir. But I think the history shows us oppression will not continue forever. A system of slavery, transatlantic slavery lasted for three and a half centuries. You know, at the end of the day, it was abolished. So you have to have the belief that a just world is possible. Then the second step is once you 
think that a just world is possible, how does it come about? Sometimes liberation struggle is violent. Sometimes there are reasonable people, you know, thinking that this, this can't go on. Deng Xiaoping came up with a formula, interesting formula, with the conflict between India and, and Pakistan and says, look, we might not agree with the political status of things, but we might agree on the, econo the need for economic development, of joint economic development. Can we put out a trajectory where we develop a disputed region together with all the parties involved, make sure that Although the political status is not divine, but uh, uh, economic freedom, uh, economic development, freedom, uh, you know, intellectual freedom, these are things we can develop, we can work on. So I think that uh, uh, DTM should be a guide for getting practical solutions for conflicts like this. And the, the biggest problem is that our mind, given all the experience, sometimes is so the fact is that we think this will be forever like that, you know, and there will be no solution unless one party crushes the other, you see. Uh, but I, 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 I do believe that history shows that there, that is not the, the case. <clears throat> Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhu. I completely agree that we have to look forward uh, that another just possible world is, uh, world is out there and we have to put effort to realize that. Uh, make it come into fruition. And DTM, I'm sure, has a very important role to play in that. So uh, that's the end of our webinar. Thank you all very much for taking part in tonight's webinar. What a webinar. Thank you very much for all your comments and questions. Very enriching. And I hope that tonight's webinar has piqued your curiosity and has given seasoned decolonial thinkers among us, as well as those who are new to the field, much food for thought and fuel for action. Uh, we welcome all of you to further engage with us on decolonial theory and myriad of other topics that are our focus through our games WhatsApp group. Uh, the link to join the WhatsApp group has been posted in the chat. Uh, also, we encourage audience to get in touch with Sandhu Hira through uh, Decolonial International Network Foundation website. His book, Decolonizing the Mind, is a fantastic read, absolute treasure, and you can get a copy if you are in in the UK from the Islamic Human Rights Commission's website. Uh, our next webinar series is a seven part lecture series on <coughs> applied multiplexity. Uh, multiplexity, Ibn Khaldun as an example. This series will be delivered by Professor Recep Senturk who is one of the leading scholars in field of social sciences in Ibn Khaldun. This lecture series will start from tomorrow, Tuesday, 7th of Feb. Again, the link to join is um, in the chat. Uh, more information will be shared in the WhatsApp group. So if you haven't joined the WhatsApp group, you're most welcome to do so. Uh, once again, thank you, Sandhu, for being with us, sharing your thoughts and on decoloniality and other topics. And thank you all, thank all of you, all the attendees for enriching this webinar with your presence, your comments, and your questions. I hope to see all of you in the next seminar. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Bye.